Um, liquidity panel, we've had a liquidity panel in Macau, we've had a liquidity panel here in Cyprus. Um, very high caliber gentleman up on stage, very, very impressive uh, group and knowledge base, and I'm very, very excited for the information that they'll portray very, very shortly. And in the meantime, Mitch will be taking the stage from now. He'll be moderating the liquidity panel. And Mitch, please take it from here, sir. Sure. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending the liquidity panel today. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, letting each, each of the speakers uh, on the panel uh, introduce, them, introduce themselves and say something about them. I guess I'm first. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the panel today. Um, so my name is Jeff Ward, I'm head of sales for EBS, um, which is a, a foreign exchange platform. Ironically, as I walk around the conference, I, I find that some people don't know who EBS is and maybe not a household name within the retail, um, with the retail segment within foreign exchange. But we operate basically the largest foreign exchange brokerage, uh, electronic brokerage um, in the world uh, with about 150 million um, ADV. Uh, primarily, um, we are the market of reference for euro dollar, yen related uh, pairs, dollar yen, euro yen, and, and, and crosses, as well as uh, Swiss. And increasingly, um, also in electronic NDFs which has uh, basically based on regulatory changes out of the states and also in Europe has become, uh, is increasingly becoming an electronic marketplace. So we, uh, we've been at that for the last five years and, and we see, see that taking off finally. Um, and I'm also responsible for a new product called EBS Direct, which is uh, something I can talk a little bit more about uh, as the panel goes through from a liquidity standpoint. Uh, Norbert Lukasiewicz, uh, I'm from Integral. I focus on retail brokers and that segment. Uh, Integral, most of people uh, should know us, we've been here last year and uh, uh, we focus on uh, liquidity aggregation, that's why I'm here, uh, price distribution and uh, order execution. Uh, we've been working with, the, uh, with different types of uh, participants in this market but retail space is, uh, we find really interesting and uh, it's always a very, very important uh, event for us. Uh, we focus on retail space a lot, uh, and we we focus on providing the best tools to retail brokers to to maximize their business, to grow, to give them flexibility. I'm Kurt. I'm from Saxo Bank. I'm the COO of Markets there. Uh, I have a couple of primary areas of responsibility, uh, starting with uh, managing relationships with liquidity providers. Uh, I'm responsible for our price and flow optimization. I'm also responsible for our API distribution channels. I say channels because we primarily have two. We have uh, Saxo Bank as a liquidity provider, i.e. a single bank feed. Uh, we also offer a prime of prime service where we offer DMA via, via the API. My name is Drew Neve. I'm the CEO of FXCM. And most people know us as uh, you know, one of the largest retail FX firms in the world. Um, what you know, probably most people aren't aware of is that FXCM, about 25% of its business is institutional business today. Um, we, as of last year, own um, the largest non-bank market maker you know, in the world, Lucid Markets. Um, we also uh, do provide liquidity to something on the order of 200 or so different brokers. And, uh, you know, it's something that we actually do not a very public, publicized role, but something we do a lot of. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Verseffeld. I will be uh, the new guy on the block. Um, I work for Solid uh, Trading. Uh, Solid Trading is uh, the leading non-bank market maker in the Netherlands. Um, we're just around for five years now. Um, uh, Solid uh, FX is our true ECN platform. Um, our entire product suite has been uh, developed in-house from ground up and uh, bring it more to the open now. Um, we've got a wide range of clients all over the world, actually. Um, and we're very known about our effective way of working and a transparent way of working and communicating by, uh, with our clients. Thank you. Uh, so to start off, um, first question is, will retail FX brokerages continue to be able to be market makers? or will this be reserved uh, for banks, hedge funds, and other large institutions? Drew? I think that, um, you know, traditionally everybody knows that 
most people in the business have been in the principal business, and I think that is changing uh, you know, to a very large degree for two reasons. One is that for the retail effects business to grow, trust us to develop in a retail effects business. I think the retail effects business is really haunted by this specter that the customer believes it's an unfair business. The odds are rigged. You know, it's, it'll be, you know, uh, better to play poker. And it's a very bad stigma that this business is not going to get any bigger unless the industry, you know, matures beyond that, you know, at that point. And I think for the retail effects broker, you know, because it's a non-fungible trade and the customer has to get in and has to get out with the same broker, being in the principal business is always going to perceive as unfair. I think that that's something where not just is that customer demand you know, for that is beginning to bubble up everywhere in the world, but I think the, uh, you know, the regulatory perspective, that is something that is, um, we see you know, a lot, lots more talk about it than it ever was. And if you look at uh, Dodd-Frank as an example, over-the-counter swaps, uh, and it includes, you know, a huge range of uh, over-the-counter instruments are defined as swaps, uh, essentially are going to be mandated to essentially be an agency business, um, you know, in the, by next year in the United States, and Europe is passing similar legislation, so I think this is something that, if they're doing it for the wholesale market, they're likely to be doing it for the retail market as well. Yeah, I think that uh, it's more a question of, like like Drew said, regulatory pressure. I think that uh, there's also issues there with regards to capital adequacy, and if clients are looking for segregated funds, then brokers need to put up their own money. Um, you know, in these kind of climates, it, it gets down to the appetite and the ability of the broker. Uh, Range-bound currency markets don't really offer fantastic opportunities for for returns as well. I think we've we've seen a fair amount of that, though we've been blessed with uh, higher volatilities this year, thanks to the yen, which, as Drew pointed out while we were talking before, is a, is an exotic currency by uh, by some people's definition, not Drew's, but uh, the CME, for example. Uh, so I think it, I think there will there will always be space for for market makers. Uh, I don't think that it will be limited to top tier banks or hedge funds, uh, but. Regulatory climate will influence it primarily. Uh, as also Drew said, it's, it's a question of customer choice. Uh, there is a perception, or there can be a perception by clients that, uh, that brokers work against them when they act as the, as the market maker. Uh, but, you know, it's an education process. You know, most of our clients, they, they actually appreciate the fact that Saxo Bank is, is a market maker for our direct clients because they understand that when the, in that sort of an environment, when they place when they place their resting orders, that uh, that their orders will get filled at their levels. So we can we can offer guaranteed stops in that sort of a climate in an agency business, where the stops are then then triggered and converted to market orders and filled at next tick. You know, clients can suffer from slippage and lose more than than they want to learn or lose more than they uh, than they want to lose rather. And it's a question of client knowledge. And then um, I guess this question would apply to you uh, as well, Kurt, and that is, have you found that over the last few years that the retail flow has become exceptionally sharp, uh, at least compared to what it was used to? I don't know. I, you know, I, flow change is characteristic. Um, you know, we don't really define flow by retail or institutional. You know, it really is more of a function of the size and the timing and the holding periods of the flow. Um, Certainly, with the advent of EAs and and you know some social and some following, you know you end up getting um, many clips of smaller amounts, which you know from a from a single bank liquidity provision standpoint can be uh, a little bit different to try to manage. Uh, and you know we've seen that trend, and that's one of the reasons why on our API, for example, we offer the choice of our own liquidity as well as you know, DMA basis so that we can work with clients to construct liquidity pools that are adequate for their business. Robert? You know, to answer the, the, the first question, just to, just to go back a second, uh, we've got slightly different um, challenges at Integral uh, because we focus on the technology side of things. So we have to make sure that, uh, uh, that if broker elects to be a market maker, simply they, they've got tools to do that. Uh, they, are, they can segregate the flow into the, 
the one they want to keep in house and offset later, and into the flow that uh, that has to be offset straight away. So we focus on making the uh, tools as flexible as possible, and because you know, let's face it, the times when you were sitting on a position for weeks and just expecting that you will have deeper pockets than your clients, those times are, are gone. Uh, so you have to be really clever, really intelligent about the managing the flow. And uh, we make sure that you know, the tools that we offer to clients, the broker clients, uh, uh, allow them to do that. And regarding the you know, retail, retail traders being sharper, well, it's a normal, normal learning curve. You, you would expect to, to them to be sharper. And uh, liquidity, the retail one will be slightly different, but I agree with, with, with Kurt. It's not that different to an institutional one. Probably top of the book, slightly, slightly uh, tighter, but uh, not, uh, not as deep. But then further down the book, uh, it will potentially will be similar. But uh, once again, uh, once you get the the price is out and you get the trade in, is the question is what do you do with it? How do you if you want to warehouse it, how do you react to a client? How do you provide that, you know, the transparency into your business? Uh, how do you offset with your with your liquidity providers? This is this is uh, a space that we are we are looking to uh, to provide as as best potentially best options as possible in the market. And then, uh, have you observed any uh, brokerages that were traditionally market makers, but then switched to either you know your type of aggregation model or others? Because and, and was that influenced at all by the uh, sharpness of the like the EA robots and just making the risk more unmanageable than it used to be? Uh, it wasn't the only reason. Well, there is one uh, uh, bro local brokerage that is uh, they've got a really nice car outside the hotel. With the kind of you know F1 BMW, I don't want to say a name, right? Uh, but uh, that's exactly what what, what they what they done. There were different reasons to the decision into switching a full agency model, but uh, you know managing the the, the 100% uh, agency model is uh, it's totally different uh, game. Uh, but you don't have to worry about you know clients being sharper because you essentially you aligning your interests with your clients, so you you you're essentially joining them. If I could jump in there for a second, I think we have to look at this not as a broker passing sharp flow. At the end of the day, somebody has to be on the other side of the trade. So if a, a retail broker is simply going to pass on their sharp able to monetize into a liquidity pool where somebody else on the other side is going to be unable to monetize it, then the ultimate outcome is that that person's liquidity is going to suffer in terms of quality over time. So I think that the, the, the trend that we've seen for more, more brokers switching to an agency model is much more one of uh, regulatory and capital pressures and also risk appetite. And, but what, say there is a trader that ultimately is causing a flow that's um, the liquidity, the ultimate guy at the end of the trade doesn't like. Um, what are they supposed to do? Just accept that their we, trading is not... Well, no, they don't, I mean, there are different liquidity. There, every client is a good client. It just needs, the needs need to be served the right way. Now, some clients trade in ways that they can never be profitable. So, you know, you have to go through a process to educate your clients to say, look, if, if you're going to think you're going to make money on scalping with that sort of an algo, you just need to kind of look at your executions, work with the client so that he understands his executions and understand that, you know, maybe that might not be particularly profitable to him. But... You know, you think about what, what banks do. Banks use their API channel primarily as a form of offsetting risk so they don't have to cross spreads in the market, which means that, you know, any given bank at any given time is going to be willing to express their interest in their price up to the other side of the spread. When you put these things together, you know, you aggregate to something meaningful and useful. But each client or client type needs to be put on an appropriate feed for their style. No, I think I think that's right. I think that um, you know, if you look at the uh, evolution and the, the more sophistication in on, in in trading in general, electronic trading in general, um, the, the the key thing I think two things. One thing Drew said is is transparency, and an understanding of uh, whether brokers be acting as a market maker and therefore a principal versus a pure agency, and then where they're operating as a, as a principal, um, having a very clear and and disclosed rule set around that is going to be critical. Um, so that'll exist.
but it also would be about choice and fit for client. Um, you know, it's interesting because we operate in the wholesale marketplace. Um, we, we have central banks who trade on our platform, uh, and in fact, intervene on our platform. And so it's always been a, a key tenant of what EBS stood for. And so we are seeing demand from, um, and we have had some ideas around that, how, uh, you know, how, we can, how we can provide a more transparent and trusted um, venue for aggregating liquidity. And there seems to be uh, quite a big demand and a recognition by some players in the marketplace that certain types of customers would be the right fit for that type of offering versus uh, a principal offering. Um, so we, we, I personally believe that we'll see more and more of that over time. I can conduct with that. It's, it's more like um, getting in contact with your clients and get the um, transparency and the discussion open. You have to tune the specific liquidity needs with the, uh, with the clients uh, and with your LPs and try to make it a um, uh, free discussion, uh, tune and, uh, and adapt to the specific needs they, they have and just keep on talking with them. And yep. it's, it's a mutual way of of interacting with each other instead of it won't work and we pull out the plug. It must be more in, in, in into the open, actually. Yeah, and, and by the way, I think as that trend <clears throat> it continues or accelerates or what have you, then I think what you're going to see is the industry is going to focus uh, more meaningfully on cost of execution, uh, brokerage charges, total round trip costs, technolo so, uh, the technology costs, all of those things. And, and that's where scale, um, the ability to deliver a platform in an open, transparent, open way, um, and to be able to do that at a low cost or good value for money is going to be increasingly important. Um, I think you saw that in the equity space over time as well. So I, I, my personal belief is that you're going to see a lot of compression on costs over the next uh, several years. And uh, Jeff, uh, maybe you can you, um, describe some of the uh, better ways or some of the ways that uh, institutional players now use uh, to segment different types of flow, uh, either retail, institutional, or subsets, or trading styles. But uh, what have you seen some of those tools are? And do you think that there's room for the institutional players to reinvest in their algorithms to keep pace with the, uh, the trading that's going on today? Um, yeah, maybe Kurt would be good at this one as well from a liquid provision standpoint. I was from sleeping after he said Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> but certainly from thing. our perspective, so we, uh, we operate, um, again, a central li limit order book, but we're also uh, launching a relationship-based disclosed liquidity offering on our existing network and infrastructure, uh, meaning we've inv we invest hundreds, uh, literally, uh, uh, sorry, tens of millions of pounds, euros, or dollars, whatever you want to say, on our platform, and we can very easily leverage that infrastructure, that distribution in 50 countries, et cetera, to offer this disclosed liquidity um, offering. So we're live now in beta with, um, with Commerce Bank, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and JP Morgan, and we'll, we'll add additional liquidity providers. But the point is, that what, what, what's clear is um, relationship, I think that's a topic later, relationship and um, understanding who you're trading with and the types of flows that you get from that is critical to, act, to, to maximize your liquidity. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's those types of times when you have to trade and you want to trade and you want to leave a resting bidder offer in the market of reference. And then there's other times you want to trade on a disclosed and relationship-based way. Um, and so the, those options, I think, are, you know, that's one of the biggest macro trends in the foreign exchange market over the last five years. And that looks to continue as well. So uh, would it be safe to say that you feel that uh, trading on a disclosed basis is, is one tool that can help liquidity providers manage the different types of flow and give the customer a better experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, if you know who you're dealing with um, and you have a relationship with them and every time you, you make money, your liquidity provider doesn't call you up and say, hey, why'd you make money? But on the same time, you're not running them over all the time. Uh, then over time, you're going you're gonna to maximize your liquidity, um, which means you're going to have a competitive advantage, which means that I think liquidity management from a from a, a liquidity consumer standpoint, becomes increasingly important. And technology-wise, and I'm sure Jeff will agree, it's a challenge uh, to kind of go through those tickets. Like we've we've experienced uh, in, a, in a recent uh, volatility peaks, uh, we've been executing back to back uh, over a thousand orders a second, and uh, it's something that is not known in an institutional space. So for for liquidity providers, it's uh, it's also something new. They have to adjust to it. They have to learn it. But they recognize that you know the the flow from people from this audience from retail brokers. It's uh, 
it's very important to the to the business model. They recognize that they, they validate the, uh, this segment of the market, but they also uh, have to make sure that they can uh, uh, be a part of the of the re retail retail trading. Uh, we we make sure that you know everything goes smoothly on the technology side, but the liquidity providers they they have to be ready for that as well. True. Yeah, I think to just explain it a little bit to simplify it for people, actually liquidity where it's good or not for most people, just think of it as an attribution curve on a, on a time scale. So for the majority of simple. retail dealing desks, it's simple. <laughs> I will explain it simply. Can you define attribution yeah, so curve? Yes, so if you think curve. about it as a, um, how, is it, how is the market moving versus a trade you just did, the, the market maker just did, right? Anywhere from a time scale of less than a second to, to hours, right? So most retail providers who are run a dealing desk essentially say, I'm going to take the, the client's trade in, and it must be, for, it, for me to make money, it must be an unprofitable trade for move against the client for hours, days, or whatever, right? And that is obviously the retail has gotten so much more sophisticated, and range by markets have helped that, essentially, that, uh, you know, that's no longer viable. But if you look, so now people put it at banks. So if you look at most banks, their attribution curve is they need the trade to be unprofitable for probably about two seconds, right? And if the trade is profitable for the customer three seconds or after, they're okay, they're already hedged. But it takes them about a second or two to hedge, okay? The trick is when flow gets really bad is when flow is profitable for the client Within, a, within less than a second. Within less than a second, most banks don't know how to do that, right? So now there is an issue of how do you do, how do you do? So there are some, there's, as, as, as Kurt was saying, there are some banks who will put in some feeds that are meant to, 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 to for them to use to hedge their flows, and that's good for some of that. There are some uh, non-bank market makers who are much faster, who can hedge essentially in less than, 100 milliseconds, right? So their, so their need for when, what is the next tick and is that next tick profitable for them is measured on a much smaller time frame. But it's all time frame based. And I think that that, as long as you, a broker can run his own attribution curve and say, are my clients profitable after half an hour, after 10 minutes, after, you know, and, and obviously within the wholesale liquidity space, we are talking within seconds and, my, and, and literally milliseconds, right? And so it's the, you know, most banks, as long as a trade is, you know, is unprofitable for about two seconds, will be fine. Three seconds, you know, it will be great. It's that less than half a second is, begins to be a problem. And I think that, that that's where a lot of people are seeing, you know, lots of issues. And, you know, obviously there's different types of things. If a client is doing too large a trade, that, or for example, is mixing up liquidity, for example, uh, the client is hitting EBS, which is a reference market, and uh, a single bank at the same time, you'll likely to get a complaint because the trade that, that the bank was largely going to hedge on EBS, and you just took that hedge away from him because you were trading on EBS too, or CME, which is kind of two reference markets, right? That's a problem you know, for that, uh, you know, for, for, for a lot of banks. So it just very much depends, and I think it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a very complex discussion to have, you know, in an hour, but I think it's something that what we do at FXCM is really, like everybody else said, is we, we, we are tailoring solutions to people, but really it's a, it's a relatively easy discussion to have because it's just a time frame. Discussion. And is I think it, okay, I think it and goes. It, sorry, Mitch. I think it goes a little bit beyond just time frame. Although that's uh, that's one of the key the key references. Looking at that yield decay over, you know, various time frames, and sure, certainly the stuff that decays in terms of yield for the for the LPs very quickly is more challenging to manage. But you know, if you're if you have the uh, the analysis and the and the tools to be able to construct liquidity. Where you, where it's a group of people that are able to internalize that flow, rather than passing it out to the street, uh, you know, you run the risk that somebody trades on multiple channels. So the EBS reference rate might get pushed away from them. So their P and L, if they look at their yield decay against that, might look negative. But on the other hand, if they're internalizing the trade, like what we do sometimes, or the banks that we work with do, if you can construct that 
that appropriate combination where the banks don't need to necessarily go to the street and they're using it to offset flow from, I don't know, their real money business or their corporate business, then you know, they, they result in spread capture, um, regardless of where the reference rate goes. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, what you see is that the retail players nowadays have more tooling in place and more resources than some of their institutional counterparts. So uh, that's something we experienced and uh, regarding also to the, the, the trades in milliseconds. Uh, we've got serious clients, uh, retail clients actually, who are settled a trade within 10 milliseconds or less. So uh, 50 milliseconds or more is not an option anymore uh, in our opinion. So you can see a shifting there going, do, uh, going on as well. Anyone else have anything to add on this? So, and then a follow-up question to this is, there is a customer that deposits $50,000 with a, say, retail brokerage. So they're, they're larger than the average retail customer. But their flow is exceptionally sharp. And they um, become profitable within 15, 20 milliseconds on a consistent basis. At this point in time, is it really fair to go to that customer and tell him we have to give you a different feed than what we're advertising on our site? And um, what are the different ways to, to handle that? Do you tell that customer, sorry, we can't support you, you have to go away? And in, at what point does it become a fairness issue versus just like a reality issue? I think maybe, uh, Drew, you might have some. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends on the size of the customer. If the customer is very large, so generally, Customers that present problems are usually customers that are very, very large. So we have an example of a customer that has a $50 million deposit and he's trading, you know, uh, very large magnitude of trades. That is, you know, you, you have to have that discussion with them of, you know, you can, just cannot see the same spreads as everybody else. You're trading, obviously, uh, trade sizes are ridiculously large. You can't do that. The, the, the advertising was not meant for you, right? The... Uh, the customers who are fifty thousand dollars will not ever trade a size that is enough to, you know, to move that needle. Sharp, uh, we handle with different routing, and the customer never has to know or see that he's being routed to, you know, a different stream. Um, you know, obviously size is 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 trickier, but you know, we we have to go tell the customer he's going to see a different a different feed. But uh, I think that that's something that. You know, uh, for most large customers, once they test it out, but a lot of this is all about trust. If you don't have the trust of your customers because you're seen as being on the other side of them most of the time, you're going to have a very difficult time having a proper conversation with them because all they're thinking about is, you know, how is this guy taking advantage of me? And this is a problem that the entire industry has. And frankly, that and it's not just retail brokers, the entire FX business has, right? Most of the banks... You know, have the same problem. Most of their customers don't trust them either, and for good reasons. And because this is just the way the OTC markets have had too many instances of too much, uh, um, you know, just just bad practices. And it's not just an FX thing; it's an OTC markets or even Wall Street in in general. And I think that that's something where, uh, you know, that's the kind of the, the key to the whole thing is to really, if if your customers trust you. And overall, you're trying to do as, as, as good a job as you can. I think you're going to have a hard, uh, an easier time doing this. There is no gentler way to tell a customer that, you know, you're going to go see wider spreads now because of the way you trade. Right? So most people will, you know, have a, an issue with it. But I think it's something that, you know, we don't have to do it often. We do it every once in a while. Overall, the customer tends to be happy. And I give you an example of... Uh, we, we had a, a news traders that were on the system that no matter what it was, nobody, they were, they were negative for all liquidity providers, even HFTs couldn't handle, you know, their flow. And this is something that, you know, if an HFT can handle your flow, you truly are, you know, a toxic player. Um, and there's very little choice of what to do with you. But we essentially convinced the customers to post his orders. Right, and, and you know, post him a little bit away from the market, have someone else hit him right at news time, and it's working for him, you know, just fine. I think there's lots of solutions, uh, you know, to do with a the customer. Uh, there, there's, you don't have to give up, as Kurt was saying earlier. Every customer is a good customer. Making sure that that's, that's the case is, you know, is relatively hard to do, but developing the technology 
you know, forward is what really needs to happen. And um, you, um, maybe several years ago, the uh, gold markets um, used to be less traded than they are now by the, the banks, I believe. Now it's become a much more meaningful part of the uh, revenue model for both the, the banks uh, as well as many of the brokers. I'm sure everyone has, has seen the, the gold volume especially rise. Now CFDs are in the news. Uh, future CFD products like Bitcoin might be around the corner, and uh, oil, natural gas, all these things are really entering the, are really uh, expanding in the marketplace. Do, do you guys foresee, but if you call, go and call a bank right now and you say, will you offer me CFD liquidity, like, it's very unlikely to get any, any positive responses. Especially on the Bitcoin. <laughs> Especially on Bitcoin. We'll give you CFD liquidity. So the, the first question is, do you, do you anticipate more institutional players over time as they see revenues increase um, getting involved in the CFD space? I think the biggest issue with CFDs is that related to market data. Uh, you know, the, the exchanges, you know, are relentless in their pursuit of redistribution of market data and your rights to be able to derive data and distribute prices on the basis of that. Um, and I think you really need to be careful in your choice of uh, liquidity provider and also careful in your choice of your own business practice in terms of what you do in that space. If you, if you get on the radar of, of an exchange and they come after you for you know, not paying data distribution rights for, for all of your clients, it could be uh, particularly, uh, a particularly hefty fine. Uh, that said, there are, you know, a number of agreements that can be made and can be had and are in place. And there are people like us and also some even some larger banks that, that are in the in the business now of, of, of streaming out liquidity and CFDs. And I think it's a, it's sort of a natural extension uh, of, of, of the market. I mean, you mentioned gold and commodities and, 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 and these things are, are self-advertising. It's like, you know, everybody knows at any given time, you know, where gold is and euro dollar is, so they, they're they're quite a natural fit. But everybody also, you know, has a fair idea of where where the indices are. So it's a it's a it's a household. You can't turn a TV on these days without seeing that. So, as a broker to try to offer those products to the clients, it's a it's a fairly easy sell because it's it's something that's familiar to them. So if you can provide them with an easy way to trade it, I think there's uh, there's interest. Robert. You know, I always looked uh, at CFDs as a, and that's, I agree with, with, with Kurt, that it's uh, the client can relate to them on a personal level. That's why, uh, and I think it's a, it's a progression that with liquidity providers, they will be looking into this space because, you know, a few years ago, they were looking at the re retail effects. It, it wasn't on top of the agenda. Uh, I'm not saying it is at the very top of the agenda, but it's, it's, it's definitely out there, up there. And, uh, and the CFDs will follow. We see a uh, lot of uh, activity uh, from a uh, few names that has been mentioned, uh, and also Saxo, FXCM. Uh, you know, the CFDs are, you know, becoming more and more important because it's is is uh, I would say the essential in uh, in terms of um, the cycle of, of of bringing retail clients because as a from a from a retail perspective, it's easier to uh, Know, you know what's happening with PB or Shell, then following the economy of the whole country. Once they get the bug of trading, they they will switch to FX. So CFDs are important to kind of you know educate, bring more clients into the game and uh, as end users. Jeff, yeah, I don't have a ton to add other than it's a it's a demand thing, right? And when customers begin to get interest and there's demand somebody will fill that demand, right? So it will happen from that perspective. Um, and you, know, you can argue if it's a chicken-egg scenario, but I think if demand's there, then you're going to have liquidity providers uh, looking for ways to do it. So you're saying that um, if the, call it in the disclosed customers of EBS, we're uh, pounding you with many requests to trade on a disclosed basis on CFD contracts that firms like EBS would consider investing in the technology to allow that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. It's not, certainly not a key area of focus for us at the moment, but um, to the extent we could play, uh, play a good role there uh, and a customer demanded it, yeah, sure, we, we would consider it. I think the biggest problem is that it's bonus pools at banks. 
So most trading desks are so separate from one another that, you know, for doing indices and energy, it's a, it's a completely different crew, completely different trading. There's no 24-hour capabilities in most institutions for those things. They're generally like indices in the United States, you know, would be an 8 to 4, you know, type of a desk. By 4.30, those people are long into the third pint of beer. You know what I mean? There's no, they're not watching anything overnight. They don't even know what that is. So if the, if you ask those people that they got to stay now and ran a 24-hour desk, there's no way that's going to happen. So the thing that, like what we've done uh, at FXCM, one of the biggest problems is most banks won't just not trade it for 24 hours. They won't clear this stuff on an OTC basis because they view it as an exchange product. Um, so we are actually put together a bunch of hedge funds and clear it internally. Um, so we started uh, with banks and hedge funds doing gold and silver, which is clearable for the same PBs as FX. Um, and we, we just done that a few months ago, and uh, most of our uh, metals uh, flow now is uh, agency. And uh, we're this summer going to release uh, indices and energy, you know, as well. But that's all hedge funds that we are essentially going to clear, you know, internally at FXCM. Obviously, external counterparties, with the exception of Lucid, which is, you know, a hedge fund that we own 50% of. But um, that's something that I think is very unique because most banks, you know, it will be a while before they do that simply because of just the way the institutions were built, the way that... Uh, most of this stuff was done. But if you think of uh, CFDs, we think the agency CFD business is a, you know, the next sort of really uh, big space. Because if you look at a CFD brokers today, they have two choices. If they have, they want, they want to trade aggressive flow, they got to go to the futures exchange and pay up for all those margin requirements. And if they want, and obviously those, those sizes of trades, excuse me. And if they want to, uh, you know, trade with another CFD provider, they can't have very sharp flows because, again, the timing, your flow has to be, you know, negative uh, for you, positive for the market maker for a decent period of time. And I think that that's a niche in the market that um, we're aiming to release this uh, this summer, you know, uh, fully to a lot of clients and, you know, should be. And as a follow-up, do you feel that uh, because of the uh, bonus pool structures of the banks and the, the general slowness to adapt, that the non-banks like uh, Lucid or other similar providers would have an uh, inherent uh, early mover advantage in doing well and providing good service in the uh, CFD uh, space? Yeah, it's smaller firms, no bureaucracy. So it's, for them, it's just purely an issue of does the volume and uh, type of flow justify it? You know, right now, indices and that, that stuff is still moves more than FX. It's still be booked most of the time by most retail providers. I think that, that um, there's not been a lot of interest to A-book, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, but I think there's lots of interest by end users. And I think as that becomes an issue and the market attracts a more sophisticated index, you know, and energy players or, you know, metals and all those things, I think you'll get EAs in that market. You'll get, you'll get it to the same place. And it'll move much faster than FX. So it'll get toxic faster. It'll be toxic, you know, much sooner because there's the level of education of the index business, you know, for sophistication of clients is very high. And I think that if there's a proper agency business in OTC, it could be a lot of business can be taken from the exchanges. You know, and I think that that's something that we are aiming to do. I think, I think Drew touched on a bit by saying, you know, the banks have different bonus pools, which you know, basically means that they're very vertical in terms of their in terms of their product silos. They have, of course, different bonus pools, but many also had different technology stacks, which is you know a key reason why people like FXCM and Saxo and other brokers in the room are able to deliver you know value added service to their clients because these banks not only are they unable to get their e pricing to work, you know, to it's a challenge and many times for them to extend it from. FX to, to gold and silver. Uh, it's a huge challenge for them to exp extend that into, um, into some CFD products. And then if you think about what they do on their back office in terms of their you know, single account cross margining facility, it, it doesn't exist. So this is where people like you know, us actually are able to serve clients very well. So you know, we do it on our own for our direct clients, of course, and we also think that that's a key part of you know, what people, I guess, in this room should be thinking about going forward in extending the breadth of their product catalog. 
So, you know, we're quite keen to offer that CFD liquidity over our API to, to, to the brokers to enable them to, to pursue that growth path. And then do you think uh, another factor might be uh, the fact that the, the banks might not be as inclined to really fully understand what the client wants uh, in terms of an offering as well as service? Well, yeah. I mean, they understand... They under, it's, it comes down to trust. It comes down to dialogue. We've talked about that a few times before. Um, you know, we, we have fantastic relationships with our banks. The banks look at us as, you know, we have quotes on our website. They call us the most transparent e-client that they have. So, you know, it's our role in that sort of middle layer, if you will, to, to we at least as we see it, to, to help educate the, the banks in terms of what they need in order to serve this segment. Uh, we didn't have a question yet for uh, CFDs, uh, and we're just uh, offering uh, the uh, only covering the FX market yet. But um, like EBS, if uh, the question uh, is coming from the market, uh, we're more than happy to investigate it. But for now, uh, it's something uh, way out of our league, and uh, for sure, uh, we keep focused on uh, the things we're doing right now. But if you had a place to hedge that, right now you don't really have a good venue to hedge that risk. But if, Certainly, the, if there were venues such as, you know, FXCM CFD venue or EBS venue where you could hedge that risk, would that make a firm like yours more likely to enter that space and add yeah, liquidity? Sure, sure, sure. But even then, it's, it's demand-driven and not because we want to join in and only on uh, behalf of our customers or clients who uh, have the needs for the CFDs. Um, the Metaquotes has been in the news a lot lately uh, with a lot of new products uh, for both the MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5 platforms. Uh, one of the, I guess, more interesting develops that they, uh, developments that they released was a MT4 to MT4 gateway. Uh, so far, I'm not sure how much effect uh, that particular tool has had on the market. But uh, you know, all of you up here are experts, and I was just curious uh, whether any of you uh, feel that that impact will be meaningful, and do you have any foresight into how the MT4 to MT4 gateway might affect the market? Well, I right. think, f f first of all, it's, uh, I'm very glad and uh, uh, happy that MetaQuotes recognize the, the need that the orders needs to be extracted from MT4 and uh, rooted somewhere outside it. Uh, I'm not sure if they're sending it to another MT4. It's exactly the... The, the perfect solution, uh, but it's a first step. We uh, we hope that uh, uh, they will go further with the developments. But in the meantime, uh, we have to ask really question: Once the order is outside, taken outside MT4, what's going to happen with it? Because this is like you know half of the battle. You have to cover it to the market. You have to do something with it, and uh, uh, you have to be you know pretty flexible. In, in terms of uh, you know running a brokerage, how do you want to do it? Uh, what we decided to do uh, 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 that was the reason uh, to, that we decided to uh, build our own bridge. So we make sure that the, it's it's tightly integrated uh, with our FX grid. So it gives open the options for the brokers to uh, to handle the the empty four orders the way exactly the way they want it. Uh, uh, you know it's uh, for liquidity providers. Uh, they also have to look at the MT4 flow uh, from a different, well, if it's EA flow, uh, they have to look at it slightly differently. So it's it's all about the enabling through our network uh, of a better uh, better flow from MT4 into uh, all the way to uh, to uh, liquidity providers. Because initially that was that was the problem with with Meta, with MetaTrader. It was the closed box system. It was it was no way to extract it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's the same problem uh, we uh, experience. We, we foresee some problems in there in latency and slippage because it's still in the environment of MT4 and not in the open. And uh, we're not quite fond of, of bridging and not on this kind of base. And we just try to uh, make it by our own bridge or just an interaction to make it more uh, transparent and more faster to execute. It's, it's a problem we foresee uh, as well. I think the, you know there's two facets to it. There's the technical performance of the bridge itself, which is of course important. But I think even more importantly is the quality of the liquidity behind. You know, MT4 to MT4 sounds nice, but you know if it just results in you know the creation of an even larger liquidity mirage where top of book prices are are flashed but not available, and people see slippage and and misfills, then 
you know, it doesn't actually ad address anything. So I, I think the, at least for our experience uh, and that of our clients is that, you know, proper use of disclosed liquidity pools uh, and openness in the relationship and discussion tends to lead to higher quality than, than those types of anonymous executions, at least for this segment. You know, I, I don't think anyone expect like large large players that offer MT4 like Saxo FXCM to offset the flow to another MT4. It's 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 it's. Uh, uh, but I said I'm I'm glad that Metacodes recognize the problem. Uh, hopefully they will work with all of us to uh, to enable uh, the flow to be just just handled in a in a in a better way. And you know we we open to help. We we honored to work with with FXCM with Saxo. We 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 honored to work with Metacodes. And uh, if we can get this. Uh, you know, give a bit of extra life into MT4. I know that MT5 is the new uh, new kid on the block, but uh, you know, I think there is a fair amount of life left in uh, good old MT4. If we can just put it into the, our our open network the best way possible, we'll do it. True. Yeah, I think you know it was said before. It, it, there's no different. It's the the more it is recognized that you know the business has to be externally executed. You know, by all by the software vendors in the business, you know, the better it is. So this is a great step in the, you know, this is a good step in the right direction. And I think it's a, you know, it's it's something that will make everybody's life a lot easier. You know, the the better it is. So you know, recently in the uh, the the forex magnates uh, press, which is the you know, elite uh, news source for all information in uh, the FX markets. There is no other. Correct. Um, you know, there has been a lot of comments on some of the articles about the recent uh, Build 500, which uh, apparently affected uh, some of the social platforms and popular uh, websites that brokers go to, uh, making uh, some of the functionality not be able to work anymore. Uh, what, how do you think uh, some of the larger brokerages would handle it, who may have their own bridges, or even maybe some of the bridge providers, if Build 501 stopped all bridges from working. Uh, I think we have to recognize one, thing, one fact, because the, the, the famous Build 500, as you called it, I didn't know there was a name for it, but apparently, uh, it, it was, it's blocked all the, let's call it, uh, front GUI, uh, front end uh, uh, add-ons. Uh, when, we, when we talk about bridges, we're talking about server-side uh, plugins. Uh, so, that would that would require a bit of uh, changes into a into a legal contract between meta quotes and uh, uh, and brokers, uh, because uh, you as a broker you are allowed to use server API to use uh, a manager API or an MT4. So that's uh, that was the whole idea of the technology to it's expand it, but from a broker side. I don't want to comment on uh, on uh, on that move with with meta quotes if that was a good or bad. Uh, they had the right to do it, uh, but on the on the server on the server side, it will be much more difficult for them to uh, to push it. And at the same time, uh, I don't think it will be very well well uh, received by brokers. It's true. Yeah, I think it's it's a question that you you know they could do whatever they want. I think it's uh, to comply with rules in certain jurisdictions. I don't think that would be compliant. You know, in, 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 uh, we believe in the next year or so, multiple jurisdictions around the world are going to be agency only. Uh, may take two years in some, but it's, it's coming. And I think people, if you, have, if you haven't read the 3,000 pages that is Dodd-Frank, it's good bedtime reading for all insomniacs. But it has, um, if you read the European... Mine at 3,000, by the way. Three, yeah, uh, I'll yeah. buy 3,000. It, it used to be 3,000. I think it, it, the original draft is 3,000. The regs add God knows how much to it, but just what Congress wrote is 3,000. I think the, um, the sifting through all that is to so all software providers, it's not just a medical issue. You know, unless they have external, the ability to externally route, it won't be able to be used. You know, and I think that's something that you know, everybody recognizes, including them. I don't think that that's something that... Uh, we see there's a danger of, I think the, the, you know, they just went after what they thought, you know, was their, uh, 
you know, intellectual property issues. I think that the, you know, the liquidity is an essential, external liquidity, an essential part of business model for a lot of people, certainly would be for us, um, but it is a, uh, more importantly, I think it's going to be a regulatory obligation. I think it's something that, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, an, it's not an if, uh, but it's a when, and it's, I think it's coming. And other than the United States, uh, what other uh, regions do you think uh, might be more likely to move towards uh, agency models? I think Japan first. Yeah. Japan, I mean, the Japanese regulators are already, you know, talking about, you have to remember in Japan, the retail effects business is actually systemically important. You know, where the retail effects business is a throwaway volume-wise from a, uh, for the rest of the world in terms of its... Uh, size as a relation to the rest of the financial market. The retail effects market in Japan is massive as in relation to the size of the Tokyo market. Actually, the Forex Magnets had awesome articles on this. You know, I mean, this is not kissing ass. This is actually, is one of the only places where it was covered how big the retail effects market in Japan is in comparison uh, to the rest of the market. There's probably about five retail effects brokers in Japan that each do more than all the Japanese banks combined, each. Right? I think if you look at the, from a Japanese regulator perspective, that makes the business very systemically important. And given that some of these companies are in various dodgy, you know, businesses on a parent company level <laughs> that, you know, and I don't mean dodgy in terms of the business is dodgy, but that from what a financial regulator would perceive to be a non-financial company uh, and not supposed to be taking more systemic risk than the bank, I think that's something that you'll see a, um, I think you're going to see that happen first in Japan. And, you know, our experience has been is when one re major regulator moves on something, that is going to be the case. In Korea, that is already the case, been the case for six years. Korean brokers are not allowed to internalize order flow, must use a minimum of two external independent providers, and those must be regulated either a Japanese firm or a U.S. firm, right? And if you look at... Uh, that as a standard, and that Koreans did that in 2004. Okay, so I mean, if you talk about who's who's the most progressive on this, uh, that's something I think will will come in in Japan and some parts of Asia before it even comes in the United States. Well, Europe will be last, but I don't think it'll miss the party simply because the the wholesale markets are moving towards this model as it is anyway. You know, it is not something that. Um, you, you're not going to be able to trade most, uh, except for spot foreign exchange and forwards, you're not going to be able to trade most uh, over-the-counter instruments on a single dealer platform by middle of 2014. You know, so if that's coming to, if George Soros has to go agency, John Smith is going to be forced to go agency too, you know, and that's kind of way we see that. And um, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, relationships being important and providing customers, you know, good service. And so the next question is, uh, there's a lot of uh, anonymous and uh, no last look platforms uh, hitting the market that have gained some traction, the exchange type model for FX trading. Uh, so the first part of the question is, do you anticipate relationships becoming more or less important over the next few years? And the, the, the followed by, um, do you feel that, um, so we'll stick with that. So do you feel that the relationship trading will become more important over the next few years? Um, it's our business model. <laughs> so yeah, we think so. Um, it must be more into the open. And anonymity, anonymity in this business is something uh, we try to change. Just um, uh, get more in contact with your clients, your liquidity providers. Uh, tune in and tweak uh, what you can and being more in the open as well as uh, from the cost side, as already mentioned in the panel uh, on, the, on my right side, um, there are several parties between each transaction at the moment and uh, all the clients are getting more cost aware and um, we try to educate them and see how we can manage it on a different scale and try to uh, supply their needs. Mitch, Mitch, okay. and then, uh, I know we could talk about liquidity for days here, yep. but we're running out of time. So questions from the audience? Uh, I think we'll have time for one question. If anybody has something that's really burning that you want to know. I have a question, Jason. Yes. Is that a zero that's or a, a donut? That's a donut. See, I it's got confused. Yes. I thought it was a donut, and I was it trying is a donut. to interpret. Donut it was means, a... means stop. 
I apologize for that. <laughs> but I do uh, I take this opportunity to thank you guys very much for coming out here. I know a lot of you, you know, you had other things going on, and you came out here, and you made the, the brutal flights, the early mornings. I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a hand.